I think that we are all perplexed um, by the current like state of our society. Like we look, and uh, it's it's just a, a really strange, um, a strange experience to to be living in. To be honest with you, it just seems so fragmented. It's so so fragile. Um, we have the horrific tragedy that happens with with the recent school shooting, and and then and then it just seems like. There's no real healthy debate about the issue. It just seems divisive and nothing productive happening. And it's just strange. And we, and, and we look at that, we go, okay, w- what can we do about um, the state of our society? Well, Jesus said, um, when he was teaching the disciples to pray, um, he said that you are to pray, um, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so there's the idea here that Jesus is saying that we have the ability to bring heaven to earth. And I think we could look around at what's happening in America and we could say, man, I'm not sure there's a lot of heaven coming down to this part of earth. If there were, I think it would look a lot different than it does today. And so how do we bring heaven to earth? Now, that's just a kind of an interesting concept to think about is we always think about, well, heaven is then and there. It is a place that we go to, and, and there's truth in that. We are looking forward to the climactic event of Jesus' second coming, and He returns to uh, set up His kingdom. And, and we think in terms of heaven, of spending eternity with Jesus and all those who know Jesus and have gone on before us. And that's exciting, and, and that's true. And, and we do look forward to that. But that doesn't... That doesn't like reconcile just looking forward to the future. Like, what do we do with bringing heaven to earth right now? Jesus definitely taught this is what we're supposed to do. So how, how do I go about bringing heaven to earth? How do you go about bringing heaven to earth? Well, as we look at the passage of Scripture that we're going to unpack today, and I'm intentionally not packaging it with points, we're going to have one big idea, but I'm going to let the Word really speak today because it teaches us, I think very specifically, how we bring heaven to earth. And this is what we learn in uh, verse 21 of chapter 5. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so we see that the way we bring heaven to earth is by submitting to one another. So the answer to America's problem, I think very easily, could be submission. We submit to each other. And I think as we unpack this idea, it's important for us to note that before we get into the context of this famous passage that um, we'll talk about um, wives submitting to uh, your husbands, like I, I said, Abby, you're, you're not downstairs this week, are you? And she said, no, you're not downstairs because I want you to get this word. <laughs> no, no, I'm teasing. Uh, is, is, that's a lot of times the way we like to handle this passage. But notice before it talks about wives submitting to each other, in verse um, uh, 21 it says, submit to one another. And so there's an idea that we're submitting mutually to one another. No doubt there is a, 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 a biblical uh, line of, of authority uh, that comes out, and we see that in Scripture, and we'll look at it today, but the I- idea is to yield to biblical authority, yield to the authority that um, we have in our lives and, and be able to yield to one another. And so by nature, we want to promote ourselves, but the Holy Spirit enables us to submit to one another. And there's beauty in that. There's, there's power in that. And I think that we bring heaven to earth when we submit to one another. If you look at Jesus' life, it was all about submitting to what? The Father's will. So submission is extremely important in bringing heaven to earth because Jesus made it possible for us to have heaven on earth and for us to even be able to bring heaven on earth by submitting to God the Father. And so He teaches us and models for us how we are to submit and then the Word calls us to submit to one another. So now we, we must remember that this was written to believers and it's, I believe, a how to bring heaven into the home. Like that's where America that's where America's missing it. Heaven is not in the home like it used to be. And 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 that's what made the country I think such an incredible um country to live in is that 
at the root of everyone's home, people were trying, not, not everyone, certainly not 100%, but there was, there was kind of a, uh, an idea, there was a, a mindset, there was a philosophy that it was important to bring heaven into your home and to understand who the Lord was and apply your life um, to the Lord. And we, we lived really in um, uh, kind of a Christian world. There was a, a massive worldview that most people were Christian. And they believed in the Bible, and they believed in, in the God of the Bible. They believed in Jesus. And even if they uh, didn't believe, they still respected and honored it. And, and there was, you could see that running through the fabric of, of, uh, of our country, which is somewhat, seems to me, has been lost uh, today. It, it's like there used to be a time where there was a bubble over our country, and that bubble was kind of the safety of... Um, people believing in God, people believing in Jesus. And that bubble is gone. Like it has bursted. And we're living in a post-Christian world now, and it's not there any longer. And so that's why our society is so fragmented. It's so chaotic. It seems so fragile. is because something has been lost. And so the, the Word begins to call us uh, to bring heaven into our homes. And, and how do we bring heaven into our homes? Well, the, we're going to unpack that as we go verse by verse uh, through chapter 5, but I think it's, it's really important for us to see um, that it is possible for us uh, each to take on the responsibility and go, well, if Jesus said when you pray, uh, pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, when that will is done on earth as it is in heaven, heaven has come. And so the home is where we got to start correcting the problems that our country is experiencing. It's not in Washington. It's not in legislation. You, you, you know, you, you can encourage good behavior with legislation, but the truth of the matter is, is if you change the heart, then people begin to live the way that they're supposed to live. And so as we look at this and go, what responsibility do we bear as this letter is written to the church and says, Dear church, what is my role as a husband? What is my, your role as a wife? What, what is your role as a, as a person who's living out your faith, whether it be in America or any other country on the planet? It, it goes across the board that this is the expectation for a believer in Christ as to how we are to live. And so this is what he says. Um, the word says in verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. So very clearly there, the Scripture calls us to a pattern of living. Now what's fascinating is if you watch um, any news programming and, and you see the different things that are being debated in society, it is trying to change um, the, even the designation of what it means to be man and what it means to be woman. Like, I, I saw a debate, and I'm not talking about just for the sake of um, you know, the, the homosexuality movement. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just equality. Like I saw a woman debating the other day uh, on a program and she was talking about how we need to get rid of even the word, the word man. Like it's offensive to some people and we don't need to say woman or man. We need to just say person. <laughs> so, but the Scripture is clearly calling us that there's a pattern here. And it says that a, a wife is to submit to her own husband as you do to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife. I just want to read it again because it's very clear. Uh, as Christ is the head of the church, His body of which He is the Savior, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. So wives are called to yield to their husband's leadership in Jesus. Now that's very important, that last part that I'm adding. Like it's their leadership in Jesus. Remember, it's written to the church. And so the a word is not calling you to be a doormat, but it is calling you as a Christian wife to yield. And so you need to be careful that you do not undermine your husband's leadership in Christ. 
especially living in a world that is trying to attack this very thing that the Word is teaching. And so it's trying to get you to, it's, it's trying to say that when we talk this way, we're devaluing women. L- women. Listen, the truth of the matter is, is that Jesus did more for women than anybody has ever done historically. Like he elevated them. Who made the first announcement that Jesus had risen from the dead, which is the greatest announcement human ears had ever heard? A woman. Like, like that's not who the people, the men of that day would have picked, but that's exactly who Jesus picked to receive the, the news, uh, first, the first person to receive the news. And so Jesus is always elevating women. And so this is not about demeaning women. It's just about understanding how we can bring heaven into our homes. And so when a husband is leading in Christ, we must be cautious, women must be cautious as to not undermine what their husband is trying to lead them in. Now, wives are to yield to a husband as the church yields to Jesus. Now think about that for a moment. Think about how upset we would get if the church failed to yield to Jesus what Jesus called us to do in a certain area. We would be like up in arms. We would say that's not right. The Word says that a a wife is to submit to her husband the way the church submits to Jesus. And that is a that's a huge responsibility for a woman of the Lord, but it is exactly what the word calls us to. So we look at that and go, wow, that's that's pretty strong. Now the here's the problem with this passage of scripture. And it's not a problem with the scripture of its itself, it's the problem with how it's been handled over time over history it has been used to try to control women it has been used to try to silence women it has been used to try to elevate a man's position over a woman and that's not what's happening remember before we got into the woman being called to submit to her husband the scripture said submit to one another so there's mutual submission going on here but there is a line in which it's supposed to function within the kingdom and as we are following the Lord Jesus Christ it can happen in this uh, way and heaven can come into our homes. And so we look at that and all the men are going, Amen, man, I'm glad my wife is here today. Hold on, bro, because we're about to get to your section. (laughs) And it's much more difficult than what the Word calls the woman to do. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the Word, and to present her to Himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies, He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they fed and care, but they feed and care for their own for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. So what does that mean? Like one, it means that if your wife, if you if you have a wife who's trying to live out this biblical model of submission, the first thing you should understand if you're going to love her the way that church Christ loves the church is don't try to take advantage of your role. Realize that you exist for her. She does not exist for you. That you came to purchase her. That's what Jesus came to do for the church. So marriage is to be a picture of the church. Christ's body in the home. So as people in Johnson County are looking into our homes and looking into our marriages, you know what they ought to be seeing is the church. The body of Christ between this husband and wife, that they have the ability to submit to one another and walk out in harmony, making music in their hearts like we learned about last week. And this is what Paul is doing. He's he's building on this. How do we make music in our hearts with one another by singing spiritual songs is that it starts in the home when a husband and a wife can walk in mutual submission and the the wife can submit to the husband's biblical leadership and and the husband can lead like Jesus. Okay, because we see this and we begin to realize, man, there's a huge responsibility on a 
on a Christian husband in the home. And so what, what do you do is you love and you give yourself up for your wife. Like Jesus literally, um, there, it was so unjust what he experienced. Like he never sinned, yet he took the cross of Calvary. He never did anything to offend God, yet he was beaten um, beyond recognition with what is known as a cat of nine tails that was ripping his flesh away from his body and, and, and being experiencing extreme suffering. Why did he do this? For his love for the church, us. He gave himself up for the church. And so that's what we're called to do is, as men of the Word and men of the Gospel is we love our wives in that capacity. What else are we to do? It says that we are to wash our wives with the Word. Now, I want you to just, like, to just sit in that for a moment. He says that just as Christ um, is making the church pure, we are to make our wives pure. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the Word. We must, if we're going to be able to wash our wives in the Word, the man must be able to wash himself in the Word first. And you want to know what's wrong with America? Is there are too many men who are not stepping up to the plate to lead in the home like Jesus led. They don't know the Word. They don't spend time in the Word. They don't understand the importance of the Word. Therefore, they can't wash their wives in the water of the Word because they're not even washing themselves in the water of the Word. Jesus was described as the Word. And so as people who are giving our lives to Christ and surrendering to Him and submitting to His Lordship in our lives, one of the things that ought to be extremely important to us is understanding the Word of God and washing our, our lives in it so that we can wash our wives in it. And so we ought to be able to shower our wives with the Word. The Word of encouragement. The Word of hope. The Word of courage. Like all of these things that that are in the Word. As we wash ourselves in the Word and we lead out and live those lives, then we can wash our wives in the water of the Word. And guess what it's easier for them to do? Submit to our biblical leadership because they know, just as the Scripture says, who can be against us if God is for us? Then our wives begin to look at us and go, like, who can be against me if my husband is for me? You see, we have the ability to wash them in the Word. And so they don't have a difficulty submitting to our leadership because we're leading like Jesus. And we begin to see that when you treat your wife this way, the outcome is that you have a radiant bride to present to whom? Yourself. Did you see that? Like Jesus washes the church in the water of the Word so that He has a radiant bride, a radiant church to present to Himself. And so there's coming this day in the future when Jesus will return and all those who have come into the kingdom of God and given their lives to Christ and and they understand and know the gospel and because of the gospel they know Jesus. When Jesus comes back, the church, the body of Christ will be presented to Himself as a radiant church. And so as we love our wives this way, we are, we, are, we are taking care of something that we present to ourselves as Christian men. And as we think about this, the Scripture calls us, we do it in such a way that we are, like we are caring for our own body. And so when the Scripture says, wives, submit to your husband, and, and the husbands are like, yeah, yeah, You need to understand what it's calling the woman to submit to. It's calling the woman to submit to a husband that is fulfilling that role right there. And so when we look at that, we go, wow, man. Like, like, like I could see that. Like, I, I wouldn't have a problem submitting to a husband if he loved me that way. And, and so we could see as a, a, as a man, like I read that and I, I'm seeing as a Christian husband, man, there's, there's a... There's a heavy load on me, and, 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 and it, it almost sounds like, I don't know if I can do that. But we've been learning all the way up to chapter 1 that I have the spiritual wealth of Christ in heavenly places. It has been put in me. The Spirit of God is in me. I've been sealed with the Spirit. Why? So that I can live like Jesus. So that I can love my, life like, my wife like Jesus. So I, all that is necessary to enable me to live like this is Christ Himself, and it is in me. And so we look at that and we go, okay, 
Well, wives are called to submit to their husbands. Husbands are called to love their wives the way that Christ loves the church. And then we look at verse 31 and he begins to put it together. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. This is how we become one, is walking in mutual submission to one another. We pray that we live out the oneness that we are. I often will pray over my marriage and, uh, to Abby, and I will ask the Lord, Lord, help us to live out the oneness that You've made us to be. Like, Help us not to just say that we are one. Help us to live it out on a daily basis. Why? So that others who are looking into our home can see a picture of of your body, the body of Christ in our marriage. We are made into one. And so submission is how that happens. Now here's what I would say to you. Submission is not about domination. Submission is about glorification. When we submit to one another, we're not experiencing domination from the other person. In biblical submission, we're experiencing the glorification of the Father as He rains down His blessing upon His children because they are walking in harmony and making music in their heart, a melody of spiritual songs and hymns, and they're walking through this world as the church, the body of Christ, and He's able to bless what it is that we're doing. And so we are to love our wives like ourselves, and, our, and wives are to respect that leadership. And so you want to be careful that you, as a wife, if your husband is trying to grow, don't, like, don't, if your husband is trying to walk this out and he's not batting a thousand and he won't, okay, he won't, but if he's trying, don't throw this in his face and say, hey, you're falling short of what Jimmy talked about. In that moment of opening your mouth, you're undermining his leadership. If, if you're a Christian husband, don't throw this in your wife's face if, if you feel like she's not submitting and, and tell her you're not submitting to me. Try to love her to bring her to a point of submission and walk in unity with one another. You, you see, if you're not careful, this is laid out in Scripture as a way for us to bring heaven into the home. But if you're not careful and you undermine your husband's authority, what you will end up doing is bringing hell into your home. And that's what's wrong with, with, a, with the country today. Is there's too much hell in the home and not enough heaven. If you don't love your a wife like Christ loves the church and care for her that way, you're bringing hell into the home. And you're bringing chaos into the home. And things become fragmented and broken. And so the way that it works is that we, we realize, man, I want to bring heaven into my home. And so the kids are all like, man, this is strong. Like, Mom and dad got a huge responsibility. I know my kids are going like, they're, you're probably thinking, boy, I bet dad wasn't, he sure wasn't submitting, right, or mom wasn't submitting right there, and dad wasn't loving right there. That's kind of what you're thinking about, wasn't you, Jonah and Joel? Well, let's just get on down to your part of the Scripture then. <laughs> Children, it says, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. And so what does it teach us? It teaches us as children, not just young children like I have in my home, but even as adult children to seek to obey and honor and respect our parents. Now obviously, when we leave the home, we leave our mother and father, and we cleave to our wives. We have a new family unit, so obedience doesn't carry the same weight for the new family, but certainly honor stays there, that we are to honor our parents. And so children are to seek to obey parents. Why? Because it is right. It is the right thing to do, the Word says. And, and, and as parents, what, there's, a, there's a heavy responsibility on us to teach our kids to obey because it is right. So don't seek to rebel. Seek to be right. You see, the, the lie the enemy is going to constantly try to stir up among us was, well, you're a teenager. You're supposed to rebel. Like That's just what teenagers do. Not according to the Word of God. What, what teenagers do who are part of the body of Christ, 
They obey their parents and they honor them. They look to them for leadership. And so honor your parents. Why? That it may go well with you. It's it's a promise that you will enjoy life. And I think it has to do more with the, the quality of your life than the quantity of your life. Some have said, do you know why that it says so that it may go well with you, like obey your parents so that it may go well with you and you may enjoy long life on earth is because if you don't obey their par- your parents, they may take you out, right? No, that's not, that's not the idea. The idea is, is that the Lord is looking. He's looking at you as a, as a young person. And He cares about how you live just like He cares about how your father leads in the home and your mother submits to His biblical leadership. He cares about how you submit to your parents. And He's watching and He, he wants to help you in that. And so how do we bring heaven into our home? Is we, we bring obedience and honor. And if we're disobeying our parents, guess what we're doing to our home? We're bringing hell in there. Like when you're a rebellious child, you're bringing hell into your home. You're impacting your siblings. You're impacting your mother and father's ability to be able to love each other like Christ loved the church and submit to each other. And so like you look at that and you go, I don't want to bring hell into my home. Then do what is right and honor your parents and obey them and esteem them. And then it goes on to talk more about parenting in verse 4. It says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in training, in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, I think this would apply because of we just went from uh, the two shall become one. I think it carries over for both parents, but I think it uses the word father specifically because the Scripture wants to be intentional about how important the, uh, the role of the father is in the home. The word exasperate comes from the Greek word paragizo, and it means against God. And so when it says don't exasperate your children, it says don't turn them against God. Like our role as Christian fathers is to point our kids to the Lord with how we live and how we treat them. And so they are to look at us and the way that they see us living out our faith and loving their mother as Christ loves the church. And they see mom submitting to the, um, their father the way uh, that, that the church is to Jesus. And they see them walking in unity and, and, and the kids are, 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 are living that out. And they, they ought to have the ability to, to, to see the Lord in that. Like if a marriage is supposed to be a picture of the body of Christ, the people who ought to be able see ought to be seeing the greatest picture of Jesus are children who are born to a Christian husband and wife. Like the brightest picture of Jesus in your home should not be me. On Sunday, it's you. On Monday. And your kids look, and you have to be see, able to see Jesus in the marriage in that home. And if not, if we're not living this out and, and trying to allow the Holy Spirit to enable us to do it, then what happens is we can very easily turn our kids against the Lord. So we have a responsibility to shepherd the souls that have been entrusted to us. And that's how we bring heaven into the home. And so as I think that one of the reasons that it, it uses the word, um, you know, fathers don't exasperate your children that uses father specifically is because I think that young people as they look to their dad I think they see man that when when a when a young person like I can remember my dad all my life he didn't go to church um and my mom like I can remember her praying for them and he would go every once in a while we had service on Sunday nights and he would go and I can remember being worried I didn't know if he knew the Lord I knew that sometimes we would talk about it, and it's like my dad was a great dad, but I didn't know, you know. And I lived with this fear growing up in the 70s. If he dies, will he go to heaven or hell? And like I love my dad, and so I just had this constant tension. And, and, and then my mom would say, it's time to go to church. And you know what the devil did? Like Disney came on every Sunday night at 6 o'clock. We didn't have a Disney channel when I was growing up. It came on Sunday nights at 6 o'clock at the same time church was. So there's this battle with my mom about, I don't want to go to church because this special was going to be on. You know, the Disney special is on. And she would say, no, we're going to church. And I would say, well, dad's not going to church. And so he was turning me away from God. Not intentionally, but in the way he was living. 
And I can remember, man, when I was 16 years old, something switched for my dad. And he started to attend church not only on Sunday nights, but Sunday mornings. And he started to read the Word. And I knew he had an active prayer life. And all of a sudden, man, my heart was tenderized to the Lord. Because my dad was turning me toward him just by the way he was living. And that's what the Scripture is saying. This is how we bring heaven in the home when a, when a Christian father understands that, that he can point his kids to the Lord. And so some of you are probably sitting here and you're like, man, I wish I would have heard this message. Like uh, 20 years ago, my kids are grown. Listen, it doesn't matter. They're still watching. They still have a relationship with you and they still will learn from you. So it's just, just be in love with the Lord and you still are influencing your kids. So he says, fathers, don't exasperate your children. And then he moves on to the final section and he says, slaves... Obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. Sometimes we read a passage of Scripture like this and it's confusing it to us. We go, man, is the Bible condoning slavery? Absolutely not. Like when this was written, there were um, as many as six million slaves in Rome. And so, like, it's not condoning it. You're taking it out of context if, if, if you're saying that's what's happened. What happened was, is people were coming into the kingdom. They were being born again and they were slaves. Well, all of a sudden, slavery wasn't going to go away, and so it had to be dealt with. What kind of slaves should you be? All of a sudden, people were getting born again, and they had slaves. Well, what do you do? This is the kind of slave uh, master that you should be. And so we look at that and go, what is the application for us today because we don't have slavery? I think the timeless um, application as we cr travel across time for the bridge of application and what it means today is it's about employment. What kind of employees should we be? Well, I think we should be people um, that are uh, uh, serving our employers like they're Jesus. Like you go to work for Jesus tomorrow. You don't go to work for some other company or corporation. You work as unto the Lord. He said, that's what the Word is calling us to do. And then it goes on and it says, And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is, is, is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. So employers are to treat employees like Jesus, and, and em employees are to treat their employers like Jesus, not when they're watching. You don't just do a good job when your boss is there. You do a good job when he's not there. You, you, here's the thing when it comes to employment. Your company ought to be making more money if you are a believer in Christ because you work for them. There ought to be a blessing happening in that company. Why? Because you go to work with the attitude that I work for Jesus, not a company. Like, I, I know they pay me, and I know they, they, they have their own responsibility, but my attitude is, is I'm going in and I'm serving the Lord in my place of employment. And I'm treating my employees as if they were Jesus Himself. I'm caring for those I lead. I don't try to threaten them or use fear to motivate them. I love them, and I lead them the way that Jesus would lead them. And so here's the big idea of today's talk. Dear church, each for the other and all for the Lord. Like that's what the word is calling us to do. Each for the other and all for the Lord. Submi submission is never a problem when everyone submits. But submission is always a problem when only one submits. When the husband submits to the authority of the word and the Lord in his life, it's never a problem for the wife to submit to his authority. It's never a problem for him to even submit to his wife's authority because they are mutually submitting to one another. And so Jesus taught us that the greatest is the person who uses their authority to build people up, not make themselves feel important. And the way that he modeled this is we know that in John chapter 13, to show them the full extent of his love, he washed their feet. 
the lowest thing a person in that day and time could do. And so this is how we bring heaven down to earth. We submit to one another. It's a joy of my life to have people around me um, that, that submit to my authority. Like, it's just a joy. And here's how it plays out. Like, um, Corey is kind of poking fun at being uh, younger than me, right? I remember I had him in D group, and he said, uh, I figure I ought to listen to a guy who's been teaching the Bible longer than I've been alive. I said, what? <laughs> I didn't appreciate that comment very much, but it's true. But what I did appreciate is he, he willingly was placing himself under that authority. Well, guess what it's easy for me to do? Is place myself under his authority. Like, he is the body of Christ just like I am the body of Christ. I, I love having Shay around because Shay is easy. He submits to that. But it's easy for me to submit to him. It's easy for me to learn from him as he learns from me. And we mutually are making music in our hearts. It, it, it's easy for us when we're all for um, each other and everyone for the Lord. It's easy for us to walk through life not worrying about somebody trying to get one up on us. We're all for each other. And when we're all for each other, like that's, that's when the Lord looks down and he says, how blessed is it for um, my people to dwell in unity. And, and so we bring heaven down to earth because God looks at it and he goes, like this, this is what I want to I want to bless. I want to do something here. These people are getting it. They're living it out. He looks in a home and he goes, I want to do like I want to pour more blessing out in that home. I think the Lord is probably looking at many of our homes and going, man, oh, I so want to answer the prayers that you're calling forth on a daily basis as you're asking me to bring healing into this relationship. He's, he's probably just so dying to pour out the blessing. But because of his holiness and his righteousness, he can't. Because he would be rewarding something that would perpetuate problems in the home. And he's like, I can't bring heaven there because you're not yielding to me here. And so it's, it's like encouraging to look at it and go, whoa, 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 this is how God fights for me. It's that when I line myself up with his word and I yield to his authority in my life, then the Lord pours out blessing in the home. Why? Because it's heaven coming to earth. And why would heaven need to come to earth? Because there's a whole lot of people who aren't headed to heaven right now. And the only way they're going to get there is through the gospel. And the only way they're going to receive the gospel is if people are preaching it. And the only way to really preach it, it says, how precious are the feet of the one who brings good news. You're preaching a gospel in your home. You're preaching a gospel at work. I'm not the only one preaching. Like I'm doing it in a public w manner right now, and I'm proclaiming the gospel. But as the church, with the way we live, we're preaching a gospel. And the call is, dear church, preach the gospel of Jesus, not your own gospel. And I will pour out blessings upon your life and enable you to share the good news. And so as we kind of land today's talk and we go, man, it's kind of heavy. <laughs> like, it's like, whew. like, the most important part about today's talk is your heart is yield to the calling and God will grow you into that person who knows how to faithfully live out what he's calling you to do. So don't, don't stand against it. Don't hold the truth down. The first step to walking this out is letting go and letting the Lord into it. Like letting the truth out. Like, man, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live that way. And I'm going to live that way in the power of of the, and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to try to live it in my own power. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit move in and through me and help me. <laughs> All you have to do is surrender and Jesus will love your wife 
through you. That's how it works. You don't just try to do it like Jesus did it. Surrender and let him do it through you. And when you're not, repent and start over and let him do it through you. Let the Spirit enable you to love your wife like Jesus loved the church. And let the Spirit enable you to submit to your husband. And let the Spirit enable you to obey your parents. And let the Spirit enable you to work like you're working for Jesus.